welcome to the EPRS Chronicles. This is our second episode on our series on climate change. In episode one, we talked about the worrying effects of climate change on our planet. And uh, in this episode, we are going to delve into a little more detail on what the EU is doing to try and mitigate the effects of climate change. For this, I'm joined by Lisa Lotta Jensen, EPRS policy analyst specialized in climate change. Hello, Lisa Lotta, welcome back. Hi, thanks. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what the EU is doing, uh, because we know that the EU plans to go climate neutral by 2050. How are we going to get there? That is a good question, but the first key step was the agreement of the EU climate law, because that made it legally binding for the EU and its member states to deliver climate neutrality mm -hmm. by 2050. So going climate neutral means that any remaining greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are balanced by removals. And removals can be by planting trees that absorb carbon or by technological solutions like direct air capture, for example. Um, we also have a legally binding intermediate target for 2030, uh, which is to reduce our net emissions by 55%. And this is compared to 1990 levels. So now we're in the process of making sure that we have the targets and the frameworks needed to actually deliver on the 2030 target. And this is where the Fit for 55 package comes uh, in play. It is a package consisting of 19 legislative proposals that cover everything from energy to climate policy. And can you give us some policy examples of areas that the Fit for 55 package uh, covers? Well, there are quite a, quite a few examples to choose from as, it, as this is a really broad package. Um, one that has received a lot of attention is the potential role of renewable hydrogen um, as a climate neutral energy carrier, because this can have a key role in helping uh, energy intensive industries to, to lower their emissions. Mm -hmm. Another example, if we uh, talk about something that is already in place, the EU emission trading system, the ETS. Uh, this system has been very successful in reducing emissions in industry and energy sectors already. Um, and we will now seek to transfer this success to areas that are, that are proving a bit more difficult to decarbonize, which is the transport sector and buildings. Um, in transport, we are also looking at other initiatives. These include uh, the, um, the infrastructure that we need, so refueling, hydrogen refueling stations and uh, charging points for electric vehicles, but also the agreement to, to phase out diesel or petrol-powered uh, cars from 2035. All cars should have zero CO2 emissions, so that is an important step in this direction. For buildings, buildings are very difficult because in Europe we have a lot of old and historic buildings mm -hmm. and it is very difficult to make an old building have the same energy performance as a new building. Mm -hmm. um, but the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is taking a harsh look at the worst performing buildings uh, to ensure that, that we take action to lower the energy bills uh, of households in such buildings. Well, it sounds very comprehensive and very ambitious, but it might also prove to be costly, I can imagine. So can you tell me how much is going climate neutral going to cost us and who will fit the bill? Going climate neutral um, will cost trillions of euros. The money will primarily come from private investments, mm -hmm. um, but public and EU funds um, can play a critical role in ensuring uh, the necessary infrastructure, in stimulating innovation and creating the framework conditions needed uh, to move us along uh, in this transition. Now, I realize that trillions sound like a lot, and it is a lot, um, but we need to keep in mind some of the cost of the impacts of climate change, which we were discussing in our last episode. Um, first of all, the damages that we are already experiencing and that will increase uh, coming from extreme weather events, but also the loss of European competitiveness if we fall behind on the transition curve internationally. Well, it sounds like this would make a lot of economic sense in the long term, but in the short term, is there any risk that industry might move to regions with less regulation and lower costs? This is for sure a, a concern that policymakers are also trying to address. Mm -hmm. um, 
you might say that European manufacturers have already been paying for their emissions for quite some time in the European emission trading system. Mm -hmm. um, but for some key sectors, in order to ensure their competitiveness, they have been receiving free allowances. Um, and these will now be phased out because we will not be able to reach climate neutrality uh, unless we do so. Uh, this means that they will have increased costs uh, linked to their emissions. And in order to address this and make sure that there is a level playing field uh, between European products and foreign products, any foreign product that will be imported into the EU um, can be subject to a carbon tax. So this is the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which targets specific sectors uh, that have a high footprint uh, and in which we would like to make sure that the European, um, the European manufacturers are not undercut because a foreign product does not have to pay the same costs. So we are looking at a carbon tax on the border. All right, that sounds like uh, it safeguards industry in some way, but how does going climate neutral affect private citizens? Are there any costs that they would have to bear? For private citizens, you might say that, yes, there will be costs, but there will also be opportunities because this is a transition into, into a new type of economy and new areas. Um, so at the current stage, what we've been hearing a lot about is, of course, the increasing costs for citizens uh, as a consequence of including transport and buildings in the emission trading scheme because the price of fuels will increase. Um, this will also make it more attractive to, for example, invest in electric vehicles or to do uh, building renovations. Um, when it comes to opportunities, we will have new sectors and, and new kinds of jobs. So there will be both opportunities in high skilled sectors like engineering, but also in, in for low skilled workers in building renovation and installation of solar panels, as an example. Well, once more, it sounds like there's a lot to be gained in the long term, but I wonder if uh, we are likely to see any social unrest, any instability in the short term as a result of um, Europe transitioning um, and trying to become climate neutral. It is for sure very important that we pay attention to the social cohesion um, and possible social tension or unrest during this transition period. Um, there will be citizens who will find it hard uh, to afford to change their cars or to make an expensive home uh, renovation um, and will be faced with higher bills. Mm -hmm. So one of the initiatives for this group is the EU Social Climate Fund, which will focus on supporting to finance building renovations, but also to provide alternative transport options um, for regions or industries like heavy industry or coal regions. Uh, the EU Just Transition Fund has been established in order to uh, help transition sectors or areas into, into new economic um, opportunities and also to help provide education or training for the people uh, living and working in those, in those areas. Um, it is still very important that we keep in mind the price tag for doing nothing. Um, we have already started witnessing the impacts of climate change and there's more to come. Mm -hmm. So it is very essential also that we don't only focus on mitigation action like we're doing with the Fit for 55 package, but also to put more focus on our needs to adapt to these changing circumstances. Thank you very much, Lisa Latte. Join us in episode three, where we will talk a little more in depth about climate change adaptation, what it means and how to combine its actions with actions to mitigate climate change. Mm -hmm.